Yes. Hi, good evening, everybody. Please take your seats. Thank you very much for joining. Just feel free to sit around, sit, mix with the panel, with the participants, not panel. <laughs> Mark, where would you like to sit? Anywhere, I think if we break the, yeah, the panel format is great. It is, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for joining the first uh, BK Talks of the year 24 which is also the, BK, the last BK Talks of the semester. There's an echo. Hello? Is it any better? No? I hear myself, but I don't hear them. Hello? Who? Is it any better? Hello? I'm going to get started anyway. I think we need to go on. Uh, I hope that the microphones will be fixed as I am, as I am talking. I am now the person who is more, bo more bothered. So, um, as I was saying, thank you very much for joining this format, uh, first of all. Thank you very much for getting closer to us and uh, uh, staying away from the Tribune or coming from the Tribune. This is, as I was saying, the first BK Talks of the year 24, as well as the last uh, BK Talks of, of the semester. At the very end of the uh, meeting today, I will also let you know about what is it that we're going to do through the, uh, through the semester. But how did we get here? Um, the reason why we are organizing these BK Talks, which is actually called Extensive Works, uh, large formats as tools of communicating design, is because we wanted to do two book launches. We started uh, together with, uh, with Dick, having a look at this book that has recently been uh, um, Launch. Uh, Dick and Simona are two of the co-authors uh, done that book. They will talk about it, so I'm not going to present the book themselves. Um, the conversation also expanded towards another work that has just been released. This is Simona Orsini, um, Orsina, Orsina Simona, um, latest, uh, latest book that she co-authored. I should say that I know this work very recently. It's a large format, which is uh, located here. But I have done a lot of housing books before I was here at TU Delft, and this was really an inspiration. Casa Milanese, I want to thank Simona for all the work that she has been doing so many, for so many years. I know Simona for a while, actually, and uh, we have the same passion, I think, for, for housing, um, and for collective housing, I would say. Um, the idea was not to have two book launches, actually. So, as talking with, uh, with Dick, our dean, we were thinking, why don't we speak not only about, uh, about these two large books, but about large formats of B uh, models, like we have here, or um, we've, we found this beautiful, we, we didn't find it, it was easy to find, but there was, there was this huge model in the, in the South Serra, no? and they're like, let's just bring it in, because this is another way, a large format, in order to communicate design. And we wanted to expand the, uh, the conversation even more. No? What happens when you start putting big formats of art inside the public spaces, inside our cities? And then we had the chance of having Mark Pimblot on one side, and also Mark Rauchrot uh, joining us today. Mark, which is uh, here, is a great artist with whom, what, great artist, and I would say in a way it's an urbanist, no? Because of the work that you are doing uh, outside, in the streets, in, the, in public space. We will have a, uh, we will organize, or we are organizing an exhibition uh, next month, hopefully. It depends, let's see what happens with the dates. In the smaller room that we just opened, the collections, the collections, uh, collections rooms, about uh, Mark's, uh, Mark's work. So, we decided finally to have a little bit of an extended version of the initial book lounge, which is talking about large formats as tools for communicating, communicating design. I already mentioned them, I won't read their CVs, so Dick van Hammer and our Dean will be uh, here with us today, or Sina Simona Pierini, which I already introduced, author or co-author of those two books, will uh, later speak with us, together with Pamli, P Mark Pimblot and 
Mark Rauchrod. I already introduced you, so I won't be, uh, I won't be uh, stopping too much. Finally, when we were deciding or what, is it, what else are we bringing, one of the things that we are accustomed to see here in this Auxerre are large format uh, exhibitions of modes of display done by, uh, by the Berlache. So we invited uh, Lineke and Felix, uh, which are sitting next to me here. Thank you very much for expanding also a little bit in the, within the room. Um, they are now, or together with the entire Berlache Institute, they are now working on an exhibition which is, which is opening next week, um, which is uh, being displayed here as a model in this big, large format uh, model. I have also seen lots of other works done at the Berlache that have to do with large formats, especially publications that I found really interesting. Um, then, I'm going to talk about ourselves, public programs. We released today that I, what we did was to put this large format pile of books in order to compete with, with formats. Today is the, one of the last days that we can still visit this exhibition here, Maps, uh, New Cartographies, New Narratives. And as you can see there, we also uh, displayed large format maps in order to show all these, uh, all these cartographies. This is the book. Um, I have invited all uh, contributors to the exhibition to please come today and take one of the books. So if any one of you is here, just grab a copy of it. We just have those copies, but this uh, is modest, uh, let's say, recognition to the work that you have done. These are some of the works that are exhibited, of course, the, in, the, in the smaller rooms. And as you have already seen in the Auxerre, uh, there are larger maps uh, that we, uh, we printed. I think large format uh, works really well. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, well, we will have the opportunity to talk about it later, no? but there's a certain level of engagement by or uh, through with the public by the fact of using uh, large format. This is something that actually personally within the, well, the Wave Factory when I was there, we did, uh, we did very often. We enjoyed public uh, organizing uh, large format exhibitions and, and shows. This is how it looks. I think this is one of uh, the most successful modes of display within the Auxerre. We as you have seen, we lay made those big walls lay, and the, I think that the relationship with the visitor is quite a special within this uh, within this, uh, this space. But anyway, I invite you to visit the exhibition in the last days. I love that picture actually because it almost looks like a model with a little one of those little puppets. Um, as I said, I think I think using these larger scales uh, is something extremely interesting. I like this contract contrast of a scale and the construction of uh, of all these big bigger models like we are seeing here, like the ones in the picture that we did uh, a few years ago, or uh, working with this sort of uh, map formats, which is, again, very large in order to attract uh, certain uh, certain kinds of visitor or speaking to different to different public. No, I believe in the, uh, let's say, the relationship that is created between the publics and uh, this, uh, this sort of, uh, of large format models. So I'm going to give the word uh, to Dick. Dick will uh, show us uh, about uh, some slides and a little presentation about the book that he co-authored, followed by, uh, by Simona, and then we will give the word uh, to everybody else. Thank you very much. Uh, Dick, the floor is yours. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Javier, for the I thought that was done. I have to do it myself. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, introduction. Yeah, I think it's a, an interesting way to uh, end this semester of the public program. Uh, looking also at things that have been produced in this semester, amazing models, books. But it's also uh, a bit of a preview. I would say you already announced uh, we will have later this year an exhibition of the beautiful work of Mark Ruigrok. And it's one of our ambitions. Is it not OK? No? It's no? Fine. OK. Should I start again? No. no. Yeah, OK. Um, so we're looking forward to an exhibition of, of the work of Mark Ruigrok, which is Part of the idea that also in this great space we show also not only design produced here, but also designs and art uh, from uh, outside of the building. And it's also a preview with that amazing model of the space where we are in. Uh, for the Dutch, uh, this is the ultimate Drost effect. If you look into the model, you will see again that the model is there 
1 to 20, and then again and again and again, till it has become a small speck of dust. Uh, almost obsessive. But anyway, it's a preview of uh, the next exhibition here, which will be uh, the graduation exhibition of the Berlage. And I think it will be uh, uh, a real highlight in the yearly series of uh, Berlage exhibitions. So also something to look forward to uh, in the new uh, semester. But okay, today we talk about uh, how to communicate design, how to represent uh, projects uh, and knowledge, knowledge of projects, but also other kinds of knowledge. We have the big maps here in the exhibition. Uh, we have books uh, and we have uh, models. And uh, indeed, uh, as Javier said, what uh, triggered, oh, now I also have a it was going very fast without me touching. Yeah, let, let's keep it here. Yeah, what started the idea of uh, this uh, BK Talks was uh, to have a book launch of a new uh, housing atlas. And maybe you think, why another one? Um, well, it's nice to make these books. I think that's what I share with uh, Simona. I hope. There's really a big echo. Huh? We have a bit of technical issues tonight. Yeah? No, it's not disappearing. I will keep talking, but I hope it can be uh, solved. Can I without this? Yeah. Maybe it's better. Well, it's still there. It doesn't help. Yeah. But it's good that I don't have to hold it. It's, it's clear anyway. Yeah, It's not too annoying, the echo, then I continue. Uh, so it's, you could say, a work, but I think all the things that are being shown today are a work of, uh, first of all, love for architecture and art and urban design. Uh, but of course, also to share knowledge. And in the end, of course, that's the main uh, intention of the Housing Atlas. Uh, I worked on it with Simona, Professor of Housing Design in Milan, Carmen Espegel, Professor of Housing Design at Edsam in Madrid, and Mark Swennerton, an emeritus professor uh, from the United Kingdom. And of course, it's always difficult to make such a book because how do you make a selection? There are thousands of interesting projects in the world. Um, and we had some uh, interesting uh, discussions about that. Uh, but in the end, I think, if I may say so, we decided to stop that discussion, to just have a kind of idiosyncratic selection of well-known and less-known projects. And then the discussion continued uh, about how to draw it, on what scale, and I think scale will be a recurring theme uh, tonight. How do you use a certain scale to produce your documentation, uh, to communicate uh, the knowledge or to communicate your artistic uh, ideas? I think that will be a central question uh, for this evening's uh, conversation. And for me, in the this new housing atlas is the scale of 1 to 500, 1 to 1,000, that shows the clustering, the ensemble of housing and how it creates an urban structure. Because I think that is, in the end, maybe uh, the most, if you think about housing design, the most crucial aspect. Because as Berlage said 120 years ago, our cities are made out of housing. Housing is 95% of the built volume of our cities. So with housing design, you also create a city. And that's what we uh, want to uh, show in the Atlas, emphasizing not so much, let's say, the dwelling unit typology, although you can also see that, uh, but really, let's say, the larger, and it's about uh, larger things tonight, the large form of housing that actually creates a city. So these are some examples you will recognize, I hope, uh, some of the projects. But there are also, as I said, less known projects. And uh, yeah, we can 
go on. And the idea, of course, is by redrawing all the projects in the same uh, format, in the same scale, it's easier to compare and, and study the projects. Because I think in the end, eh, by comparing projects like you see here the Barbican and what was on the previous slide, uh, the Rabenhof in Vienna from very different periods. But by looking at the drawings on the same scale and drawn in the same way, you can also start seeing uh, similarities, correspondences. And I think it's especially when you start comparing these projects that you learn how they actually work, how they are designed. So that's my, my short introduction uh, to this book. What's super nice is that it coincides with the amazing uh, exhibition in the corridor. You can see it through the windows, organized by Willemijn, who's sitting here, of our second year students who study all these housing projects and other ones, and uh, also make their own interpretation, but again in models. So also bringing back, uh, or working with that idea by making, in this case, models that you can uh, share, communicate the knowledge that the students got from analyzing uh, these projects. Enough said by me, I give the word to Simona. Okay. So, thank you. It works? Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. So, thank you very much for inviting me for the occasion of the launch of these two books. Um, how can I stop uh, <laughs> the movie here? <laughs> what? Okay. Yes, but it seems that it goes alone, by its own and automatical. Anyway, yeah. thank you so much <laughs> for this idea of the launching, and uh, to Dirk and uh, Xavier, first of all, and then uh, for the Marks <laughs> to be here with us to discuss about... Uh, yeah large format, and uh, finally uh, to the students and the Berlage group uh, that are trying to discuss with us this uh, idea of large formats. Um, I can demonstrate my idea of, of large formats bringing kilos of books, but also uh, with some uh, ideas that I will uh, show in the slides, and uh, with some titles that uh, some Somehow, I try to uh, develop a, a thread that uh, uh, rely my recent production, but not only my recent production. Uh, a first seminal book, an atlas I made uh, when I was a student like you, uh, about the history of Milano. And uh, the other books are more recent. Uh, as you see, the titles are referring to this idea of large formats. Uh, could be atlas, could be primer, could be uh, an atlas of Milanese houses, and finally the housing atlas. Uh, the idea um, that uh, stay behind uh, this uh, whole massive production of paper is uh, a, a cultural approach that I call packabot. As Corbu says, uh, the packabots that are moving uh, uh, into e the Europe, uh, trying to bring through the history uh, urban design, housing ideas, and finally uh, interiors uh, as uh, material for uh, designing the new city, the new homes, and the new house. And so this idea, I have a, a website for my student, it's called packabot.eu, and uh, uh, with this uh, uh, main idea that uh, I use here a quotation from Herzberger because I saw uh, a beautiful um, lecture of him here. But uh, uh, the image uh, shows us uh, Apollo, the sanctuary of Apollo in Delphi, that is the same idea that uh, Miss van der Rohe took uh, for uh, his inspiration for the Weissen of uh, sketch, Charcot famous uh, sketch for the Weissen of uh, Sid Lungen. And so we can say that the same idea of the uh, big building on the background and small houses on the foreground and also the path that uh, moves through the small houses to arrive to the uh, 
major building is uh, uh, completely actual, either in the sanctuary or uh, in the uh, in the vice. The second book uh, is a book uh, co we called Housing Prime, and it was focusing only on contemporary uh, residential architecture. And so uh, the idea was to use uh, some sketches. As you, we see, we use the drawings as uh, uh, our production. Mainly we draw. And uh, in this uh, first book, uh, it was uh, the idea of reinterpreting uh, some themes uh, of the uh, contemporary residential architecture, uh, for example, the uh, nonchalance, uh, the typological nonchalance, or the problem of the high, or the relationship uh, uh, with the um, public spaces and uh, collective spaces into the building. And so, through these uh, uh, small sketches, we used to uh, approach students to uh, the um, to the issues that we wanted to comment and discuss. Then uh, the housing atlas comparison, uh, we have been uh, seeing already uh, explained by Dick, uh, but the aim was to design at the same scale uh, so as we can compare. And it's important to know that when you compare two uh, drawings, uh, there happens something between them. Uh, new relationship uh, uh, that uh, come up to give uh, new ideas uh, as design tools. And then finally, we uh, focus more deeply on uh, uh, my recent works on Milano. Uh, this is a book made five years ago and is uh, mainly related to the urban scale, uh, the street facade and also the floor plan, obviously, but we work a lot on the facade of these uh, housing uh, uh, types. And then uh, for an exhibition we had in Milano, we mounted them in, uh, uh, in a collage to make a, an idea of city, of possible city that these architects would have been uh, uh, like a, a collective work of these architects to uh, bring to Milano a new idea of modernity. And then uh, this is a, a picture that I, lock, uh, I like because it, uh, we throw away all the matter and we stay only with the layer of the shadows. And through these shadows, we can understand all the poetical um, design tools that those architects had. And coming from uh, the outside, we began to deepen into the interiors of Milanese houses. And we began this uh, huge research for five years, and uh, somehow we can say that became like an encyclopedia, uh, because began, uh, oh, we can do something about interiors like this, and then finally, as you see from the uh, index of the designer, uh, became a, a 700 pages book. And so uh, this book uh, had also a, a great discussion about the structure of the book, uh, uh, because we decided to have uh, periods, historical periods, decades, but these decades were, um, uh, we can say, uh, each decade has his own theoretical house to approach the context, uh, the cultural context of that period. And then uh, we had uh, um, the houses not simply uh, file them, but to, they um, were uh, grouped in uh, around some uh, topics, sometimes uh, uh, an idea of space planning, sometimes the material, sometimes more a sociological issue. And so uh, the book began in 1928 because of uh, uh, either Casabella and Domus, both of them were born, were uh, found in that moment, and uh, this is a theoretical house. Very often we use magazine as, a, uh, as theoretical houses. And then we pass through, I will do it very quickly, uh, some uh, uh, example, because uh, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, Milanese architecture is a fight and hand-to-hand -hand, uh, work between tradition and modernity. 
Uh, some uh, uh, architects are more uh, related to abstraction, for example, uh, these works that seems related to a Paul Klee uh, sketches, or some uh, uh, other, as for example, the work of uh, Gio Ponti, that is mainly uh, more related to the tradition, more related to the idea of Casa L'Italiano, the so-called uh, Casa L'Italiana, as he used to say. But he opened space through this horizontal window into the rooms, uh, in between uh, the spaces, trying to uh, not to break uh, the wall as other, uh, for example, the idea of space on, in Miss or in Le Corbusier is completely different. They make a small, timidly uh, uh, approach to a, a more fluid space. And then uh, the great modernity of Ignazio Gardella or uh, the um, exhibition style that uh, Albini had, uh, uh, for example, in his own uh, spaces at home. And uh, this uh, society that is, uh, there is up down is Gioponti in the corner. And you, uh, this image can uh, tell us about uh, the industrial city of Milano the relationship between the economical, the clients, the architects, and the artists that were uh, always working together, to discussing together. And then after the war, uh, the war somehow has uh, very been uh, has changed a lot, uh, and we can follow the idea of the interiors uh, going up into the attics, for example, uh, here, or uh, camping into some uh, uh, ancient halls where, uh, for example, Caccia Dominioni mounted like a, a, a camping place uh, with garden uh, furniture to, uh, to could live uh, while his palace was completely bombed and destroyed and he had to remake it. And so uh, we see new buildings for example, uh, the Casal Parco uh, by Gardella, where uh, here the architects could express uh, in deepen their idea of adaptability or flexibility uh, with these uh, floorings and ceilings uh, passing through uh, the space in, and these doors opening uh, and up to the ceiling. And another uh, huge house uh, here, you can see also see the photographer, that's uh, an important uh, topic because uh, Milanese houses has been photographed mainly by Giorgio Casali, who you see there, and uh, um, uh, Bene Carla Bene de Benedetti who was a completely different approach. And so there is also this uh, interesting fight uh, between photographers. And then obviously about flexibility, about uh, uh, enfilade, we can have uh, uh, Gio Ponti, his own house, or uh, con, uh, uh, compre uh, compressing and open, expanding spaces. For example, Caccia uh, Dominioni in the Piazza Carbonari houses, uh, with this idea of using the plan poche idea of plan, and uh, uh, acting somehow in moving the spaces uh, with, with the furniture. And then the, the last topic is the uh, relationship with the art, with the art that was so important in the 50 and the 60 in Milano, and Somari and, uh, and other are working together. And uh, this kind of art is also using the perception of the spaces. And in this uh, context, uh, suddenly arrives uh, some major architect as uh, Ettore Sozzas, or uh, Vittoriano Verganò that brought into the house uh, such an idea of heart. Uh, by one side, uh, Sotsas with this uh, uh, bidimensional, we can say, approach, like a painting, and uh, uh, as we can see in his own house or in Casa Chirichetti, or uh, by the other side, Vittoriano Verganò, who's more uh, sculptural and uh, working with volumes, but with the same idea of, uh, uh, of an approach through, through art. Uh, also this house that use uh, uh, exhibition pieces or a new magazine as Abitare 
who uh, made uh, mock-up models of uh, new styles, uh, a community or a single girl. Uh, they were mounting idea of inhabitation uh, with the experimental house. And then uh, we, one of the last houses, it's uh, s such an impressive house by uh, Umberto Riva, all concrete, but with the floor plan that want to launch the space into the uh, exterior garden. And uh, uh, the experimentation uh, of Giocolombo, now with this idea of a unit furniture that could uh, synthesize the idea of living. And uh, uh, again, uh, in relationship with art, uh, Carla Venosta with this house that is uh, uh, completely uh, estrading. Uh, why we make this? Uh, I'm going to, to close uh, this uh, brief, uh, uh, I hope very mm -hmm. short. And uh, this is a, a part of my essay, obviously. I try it's a small essay because it was uh, already a big book. And so the publisher wanted to cut our hands because we go, went on uh, publishing houses, 220 houses. Uh, and. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, images, but uh, um, just to think that uh, this uh, big book uh, had uh, an idea to present tools for the, for the design, not only to make an historical work, and so uh, we used uh, this uh, word, actions, verbs, and uh, using uh, the plants at the same scale, obviously, the, all the plants in the books are redrawn at 200, uh, we try to make uh, uh, groups of this uh, under a theme. Uh, could be the concatenating of the spaces, could be the sequences, uh, could be, again, the idea of expanding the spaces from the small one to the Villa Borletti, huge uh, villa uh, that uh, was made uh, in the 30 by Gardella, or centering the spaces, or at least uh, deforming the spaces. So uh, this is it's, uh, the idea that is hidden into these uh, 700 pages, and also to uh, use uh, for new project for the students uh, and. Uh, also for the architects, I hope. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Simona, for uh, presenting your uh, amazing work. Uh, this book is, is really indeed an encyclopedia, a Bible. It must be a work of love. You worked five years on it, but it's also, I think that's the other red thread, <laughs> a bit obsessive. It's also a kind of obsession. Yes, but I was uh, also in the other books. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I could manage the two of them. Yeah. No, it was, uh, yes, it was quite complicated yeah. to manage all this. Uh, but that's also a link to uh, my other uh, neighbor in this uh, nightclub, uh, Mark Pimlet, uh, yes. one of the <laughs> leaders of the Interiors Building Cities uh, group of the architecture department. And I think I'm not alone in saying that, that for weeks I was walking through the corridor and seeing this model being made. A bit obsessive. I hope if you haven't seen it yet, have a look when we are finished and, and uh, count all the books that were made piece by piece. But of course, it's an amazing uh, model. But the question is, of course, why do you make it? Why did you choose this way of communicating or representing a design and, and to bring forward knowledge? Well, that's a very uh, good question. It has been uh, part of our pedagogy for some time in the interiors group, and the slides are just going to pass by here. <laughs> the authors of this model, by the way, are all uh, comprising yeah. most of the audience <laughs> tonight. Um, but we uh, use models as ways <laughs> of, of um, getting to know the substance of the city, getting to know material culture, getting to know how architects communicate. Um, and in this particular model, which is linked to a project we're doing for the Stockholm City Library designed by Gunnar Asplund, the students went through uh, a process of, of, um, of studying archival material in great depth. All the drawings, 
and sections and uh, photographs that really were available. Uh, and we have to thank Caruso Sinjin, the architects, for, for that. They had done the latest version of the project to try to work with the Stockholm City Library, uh, which was stopped for political reasons. Um, but it's probably useful to mention them in this story too, because there has been you know, this, this use of large-scale models as ways of teaching architecture is not uh, something that we invented. I think you can look at the photographs of the artist Thomas Demand, who makes these one-to-one -one models of photographs that he has, uh, uh, which are of significant political events. And Caruso Sinjin turned that into a kind of method for how they described projects of their own design by making one to 33 models made specifically for photographs. And there are others as well, like um, uh, Sergis and Bates, in, uh, or Jonathan Sergis and specifically in, in Mendrizio, and, and Daniel Rossbottom in his work previous to here in Kingston. So the, the model as a device um, was, is a very, very important way of allowing students to become extremely familiar, intimately familiar with building as it was in this case. We wanted to reconstruct the library as it appeared in 1928 and then in its later inter iteration in 1932 before all the changes to that have taken place uh, uh, could be seen. So, so rediscovering the essence of the construction, the, the intentions of the construction, the culture surrounding the construction, you know, the culture of Swedish architect of the architecture at the time which was on the cusp of tradition, classicism, and modernity. Uh, all these things could be really um, intimately known through an appreciation of the material. So what you're seeing now are archival photographs followed by the model that came from the archival photograph. And, the, and so that was very important that photographs were reproductions of those works. And um, they found the same, and this is the library as it is today. So you see this kind of uh, transformation. And uh, of course, the artifacts within the library are also very important. This furniture that Asplund designed specifically for the building, which is about civilizing the processes of reading uh, and study. And sometimes the archival material is very sketchy from which a model had to be uh, constructed. So, so this, this digging, digging and learning became incredibly important. And, and it, of course, required a particular kind of focus. A, you might call it obsession, but I would just call it a rather intense study, uh, whose purpose was to re-engage with the material as it was, and in a sense, provide a platform for the work that would carry on in the future uh, in actually doing a design for the li library, which, of course, is a very difficult thing to achieve. Uh, and the students who had uh, made this extraordinary uh, uh, artifact, which is a collection of rooms, a c collection of, of, of norm rooms, uh, poche spaces and so on, also learnt about the organization of the thing as a whole. Because the model is made in separate bits which are brought together and designed to be brought together. So in fact, the, the organization of the library as, a, as an artifact, here you see it being constructed in the film, is, is one of, um, of really learning of how, how it all works, how it's conceived, and, um, and how it is ultimately relating to the city. Now, uh, just a, a, a final word on this. Um, the students who uh, made this piece, and there they are, um, also, many of them had experience of being in our program for some time. So in MSC 1, it's part of our method 2, where students reconstruct sections of cities, mostly in Belgium because of their extraordinary heterogeneity. And to do so, they, if you can keep rolling on, they, um, they, um, they construct streets and into those streets go uh, their own designs. Uh, but to do that, they, they measure and they get to know the very, very material fabric of the neighborhood and how that material speaks of local culture. So they get to talk to local people. They learn how things are built um, throughout the course. And the model is a device for coming to know this, this, this stuff. And of course, then they, in their own designs, they make models and they photograph the models as though they were parts of the streets. Um, and um, of course, in the midst of all this, they're all doing their own personal research about how am I going to speak? And this carries on in MSC2 as well. The figures program, I can't show it. There are a lot of very beautiful films done of interiors, many of them Milano, many of them from your book, in fact. I think this is from uh, 
this is the Caccia Dominioni interior, but there is also the Gardella's interior and Gioponti's interior. So um, Milano plays a very important part in our, in our thinking too. And let me see too, th and this carries on, this is a study of the Boymans Museum. Uh, and I can't tell which are photographs and which are not photographs, but this is obviously a model. <laughs> That's a photograph of a real thing and a photograph uh, of a, a model that follows it. So it, it's, it's very much part of our way of talking about architecture and learning about the craft of architecture, and the, how architecture is articulated through, and how architects speak through making architecture. I think this is an important point, that it's, uh, it's, we can talk about theory. Uh, this is Thomas Lehmann, for example, in his one-to-one -one models of very, very ordinary things. <laughs> um, uh, but they're all made of paper like these. And, and this, of course, carries on in our own work in other studios, this was just looking at offices. And so this, we looked at these archetypal offices and students made models from the photographs that architects use to communicate their work. This is Sigurd Leverens in, in Stockholm. And in that research, they discovered, because that ceiling, for example, the color of it was unknown, but, and there were researchers figuring out what it was, but our students kind of found through documentation that it was this petrol blue in turn. And they just restored the room and it's, it turns out to be this petrol blue. So from black and white documentation, they reconstruct reality and it happens to be the real thing. And there's also, of course, another nice side product. Lots of furniture gets made, which is... So they end up they becoming involved in a really great project of material cultural recovery. And... Um, <laughs> and um, and, and this, I believe, allows them to know how they might want to communicate or through the devices they can use to communicate ideas. So in this case of the office, of course, we went through the, the idea of office and relations that existed through people architect, uh, uh, articulated through architectural form. Uh, form is, uh, and, you know, very, very interesting. And to do it, of course, you have to do special research, like what type of typewriter was that? Um, which you see in the next picture, beautifully modeled. Um, so you end up to do all sorts of funny research. And again, the, photo the models are made to replicate the photographs and to be photographed as the photographs. So there are all sorts of tricks that go on to make this happen. And it, it ends up as a theme of our studios as a device to get them to know reference material or the, 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 the archetypal models, shall we say, that they will be referring to in their own work. Um, how that relates to the book <laughs> is that, um, you know, I was sitting over Christmas with Nele Kaze, which I ordered uh, uh, months before, or not months before, weeks before from Hoepli, the publisher. And, um, and it is an extraordinary um, uh, compendium. And, um, and I realized as I was going through it, some, uh, you could say obsessively, but great study, you know, with plans and images and, 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 uh, and my own knowledge and expectations of this area, that um, I was learning that the, my engagement with the material was about learning. And that's, in again, precisely what we try to do with this kind of work. And that's a very long answer to your question, Dick, <laughs> no. is, uh, is how these things are engaged, uh, how we engage with these things. And I, as I remember, as a young architect, we had plans and photographs, and we tried to assemble our understanding, an understanding of the things that we were looking at. And it required kind of detailed looking. And um, so this is a kind of modern version, let's say, of that detailed looking. Um, and I hope it, I hope it, uh, I hope it works. <laughs> they have to say, they can shake their heads if they disagree. <laughs> we will ask later. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Mark, for uh, this beautiful, uh, yeah, more than an answer to a question <laughs> Sorry. and uh, amazing uh, images mm. and I think you're right eh? by, by making a, a, a model is a way of, of learning about a building mm -hmm. uh, uh, that you admire but but maybe just by looking at images never fully understand Indeed. I, I Indeed. Had, if I may uh, uh, tell that as a little anecdote I had that same experience when I was a student 40 years ago we and we will some, at some point this year, show again some of these models we made with Marx Salada, huge models of villas of Le Corbusier and Loos. Mm. And at that time, it was a different time, eh? we had professional model makers uh, working in the faculty. So the students didn't have to make the models, 
you could just tell the model makers which model uh, you wanted to have made. But they needed working drawings. So I made working drawings uh, for models. And that was really, uh, for me, an amazing experience. For example, we made, I made working uh, drawings for La roche en where mm -hmm. the Fondation mm -hmm. Le Corbusier is mm -hmm. in Paris. And when you look at the spaces, you think they're quite, they're quite complex in how you experience them. But when you start making, think, how can I make this in a model? Certainly, you also see that, in a way, it's also very rational, and mm. that there are ideas behind how the space is organized with material that you couldn't understand just from a photo. Yes, yes. But by making the model, you started to understand. Mm. It's true. It works. Okay, <laughs> that's a very brief and right answer, of course, but <laughs> let, let's continue. No, I, I could continue <laughs> like that, but I... I, I, I I, I do think that the model is kind of, uh, because you have to construct it, yeah. it becomes a, a, a device that you can get to the essence of what the, what the thing is you're looking at, which, which in many cases is completely uh, obscure, or uh, like a lacunae. You know, you, when, when, when you look at images, uh, we were talking about this beforehand, that quite often before we started this thing, you know, you would have students saying, I'm going to make the building look like this. You know, they'd have it an image. They would have an image that they wanted to emulate. And um, it was very, very, and the architectural form that would support it would be inevitably rather primitive in a sense. So, so looking at rather more complex historical things and saying, how, how did this, how is this assembled? Yeah. How, how is it, well, assembled as an idea and how is that then turned into an artifact of great complexity? Uh, and, what, and what is the role of all the stuff that supports it, the furniture, the light, the, 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 all these things? What is the meaning of all that? Yes, that, that comes through. Um, I think, Simona, that the next project for you is having models of all the <laughs> <laughs> interiors. I have to find the space. You, ask, you <laughs> can ask them and see if they've yeah. made them already. Yeah. <laughs> but this use of the photographs of the models is very interesting. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Because I think most of the interiors in your book have vanished, not? Oh, yes, yes, yes. We had to use uh, a lot of material from the archives. Okay, let, let's continue because we have more guests and an audience. Um, well, what, what came up in my mind when I saw these amazing images, so it's not just making models, it, it's art. They're pieces of art. Mm. I was also reminded, and I just checked, it's been extended, go to Tilburg to the pond. There's an exhibition of the work of Thomas Schütte, who works with models in all kinds of scales, yeah. one to one to quite small. Mm. It's amazing. You should go, but you should certainly come, and you will be here when we have the exhibition of the work of uh, Mark in a couple of months. And Mark, I think the introduction uh, made uh, for you by Javier was really spot on. Eh? You make art, but you also, you're an urbanist uh, because you work in public space and with your work, you, you define that space. You yeah. create an identity for that space. And I think the idea of scale plays an important role, but I think you also work with models. True. So Ooh. can you say a little bit about your working process? Uh, you want process? to about the models or the, what goes... What you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, there, this is uh, a work in Utrecht on the main office of the Dutch Railways. A UFO landed there in 1999. <laughs> yeah. And I made a model in the factory. It was uh, being made here in Holland, uh, 1 to 10, you know, in aluminum. And, um, it will be on show here. Right? Yeah, it will be yeah. on show here yeah. in, a, yeah. in a month's time. Yeah. It's, a, it's quite a nice, model because it's exact same. Uh, it's a, this is made out of aluminum, 11 meters in the in the door, door so, Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's, as you can see, it's, 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 it's rather big. And we, we uh, also made a light program, as you see. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, this, it, oh yeah, here it's good. You see that the, the door is open and the, the visitors from outer space, you know, they, uh, what, what happens? Are they, did they make an emergency <laughs> landing, you know, here? 
<laughs> and where are they? So it's and it's also a little bit like a, a bird, you know, on a, uh, sitting there, sort of helplessly. But <laughs> what was important here is that uh, this show, Panorama 2000, which was to celebrate uh, the turn of the century, uh, that a lot of artists were invited, and uh, one of the, the Dutch Railways also wanted to participate, and this did is the, the old main office, the ink well, the ink pot, and it's the, uh, the, it inspired me right away. I wanted to make a piece of art that goes together with the building, so integration. And so because I see this as a kind of a film set, you know, like uh, from Gotham City. Uh, it's uh, um, so the, the just the UFO is not, you know, it's it's together with the building, and uh, that it was very important. That makes the image. Um, yeah, this is uh, a work I did uh, in uh, Singapore in, uh, for FIFO City designed by Toyo Ito. This is on the right side. There is no image now from uh, the building uh, from Ito because that's very sort of futuristic, like old style, which is also the, the UFO is sort of like futurism old style, which I like very much, you know, somehow. And, um, but anyways, I hear also um, that if this is the taxi ramp that you see, uh, you know, people in Singapore, they, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a land, you know, it's a, it's a city, you know, the people don't have cars, it's too small. So everybody moves around in taxis, this taxi ramp going up and down around the rocket. This is it, you see the doors open, there comes a lot of light. And so it's also you hear the message, uh, uh, even, uh, you know, visitors from outer space come to shop here, you know, Vivo, Vivo City. This is um, uh, the uh, gas molecule in Slochteren, in Groningen. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's funny, like, uh, I think it's sort of, I think 12 years ago, it was, they, 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 uh, they asked me to do this, they wanted to celebrate 50 years of, uh, of uh, gas, you know, and uh, it's it's in the middle of the of the motorway, which is very exceptional, and it's uh, um, it, it's 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 the image you know from 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 the from the camera C scheikunde uh, lokaal, we say that in English chemistry uh, classroom, you know, the image of a gas molecule CH4 CH4. And it's, it's very large, it's, it's a location, and also, you know, with the other uh, works, it's a location that uh, asks for the scale, because I'm not, I never, it's not like I said, oh, I want to make something big, you know, it should be big, you know, but although I, I, I am also uh, very much inspired by uh, an artist like Klaus Oldenburg, you know, who did worldwide uh, small, th uh, small objects and made them very large in the US, in the US, but also in Eindhoven, you may know it across the, the, the uh, station. And um, this is something in, um, in Dar es Salaam, a British uh, architect, Michael Manson. It's a Dutch, English, and German embassy, and they, I want to sort of imagine an uh, imaginary road sign it says, so, uh, you see it somewhere here, somewhere and here, and it's somewhere elsewhere, anywhere, but also nowhere, you know? That if you come into the space, you know, you want to go somewhere. This is also quite a big, big thing. This is a, a nice, uh, you know, working together with uh, NL architects, was, uh, it's in Kogandazan, was a sort of an, uh, actually a no-go zone. Uh, you shouldn't come there, you know, they burned cars and they tried, you know, it was, it was horrible. And there was this idea to revitalize this space. So this was the first supermarket underneath the highway, the, eight, the A8, uh, that's uh, in Kogandazan. Uh, and uh, Actually, also the, the 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 columns that supported the, the the motorway, you know, that was sort of given to me, you know, for to to make these lanterns around it, and these these are Dutch uh, uh, poems made by uh, an Amsterdam poet, and um, uh, 
um, they, 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 they tell four short stories about Koch and Zaan, about the history and what they are doing there. And, you know, uh, it's very beautiful, actually, the text. Well, this is actually the latest uh, big thing I did here. This is a good example for, this is on a maritime, uh, maritime uh, monument uh, for the city. Then held a very long uh, uh, history, you know, in, in fishing, whale fishing, uh, everything, you know, and, and also wars, you know, uh, on the North Sea. And it's this, the double, uh, uh, the boulder is an, uh, and uh, uh, Boulder, no, Boulder is in the... Uh, it's where you, where you connect your, the, the, you know, the ropes, you know? Yeah. yeah. So anyways, so it's, but it's also the age of Helder, then Helder, it's also like a gate, you know, and uh, the texts are also, uh, are there are uh, texts that tell about uh, the, the, the history of, uh, of the city. And um, yeah, I think I think this is it so far. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you yeah. Uh, for yeah telling us a bit about yeah. your ideas, your references, and how how you perceive your own work. And we will come back to that uh, when, uh, of course, we open your uh, exhibition. Again, looking very much forward to that and. Yeah, then let's move on. We have other models there. And yeah, talking about obsession, what I really appreciate is that you even made, I think you did it today, a model, 1 to 20, of the model of the Asplund uh, building, so that in oh, your... I think, I think our, we supply, we oh, you supplied it. it. <laughs> well, supplied. that's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Um, but, but please, uh, Felix and Lenneke, can you say something about your intentions of, of the Berlage team with making these uh, models? There's also the interior model scale 1 to 10 with a lot of laundry in it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, foremost, thank you for the invitation, Javier, and for us to uh, show uh, the work that we've been doing over the last couple of months as students at the Berlage. Um, to give you a brief idea of what the project is about, uh, we have been dealing with the hotel as a building type and the skyscraper as a building type and what it means <laughs> to have a hotel in a skyscraper. And we started uh, with, by reading a novel called um, Hotel. It was written by Archer Haley in 1965. And it's, it basically follows the lives of both <laughs> works, uh, workers and guests. Um, in the hotel oh, and how their uh, storylines intertwine. Um, and then there are very vivid descriptions of how the interior of the uh, hotel looks and we've been looking at them and then we started with this one day um, exercise in which we try to select those objects that typified a certain set of rooms that we thought were interesting uh, on a scale of one to ten, so to really grasp their um, material, materialization and their form. Um, and then the next thing that we did was we um, looked at uh, model sections, uh, the whole rooms. And you know, when, when you build a model in a limited time, you're actually uh, compelled to focus, to reduce or to abstract to those things which really make the essence of the room. Uh, what can you leave out without breaking the character of the room? Um, and that was, I think, a very interesting uh, exercise in contrast to when you make a 3D model. Uh, you can very quickly zoom in or out um, and, and lose a touch of, of the scale. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe to add one thing, is that in the book they would describe certain sp uh, objects within the room, but they would never describe the whole room. So it's also because we started with the object and then went to the whole room, you start sort of to imagine and to elaborate on the narrative of the book and explore what would this room look like in this period of time and how would that relate to this object which is described. So I think you sort of ready to design and imagine uh, through the book uh, yeah, the spaces. Yeah, so it was an exercise in going from description of from words to model and then the, the, well, then we extended that exercise in a, in a section. Um, <laughs> uh, one, two, 
50. And then, well, the second semester, this semester, uh, well, we've <laughs> taken all the research and we uh, try now to uh, design a hotel in a skyscraper in Manhattan. And so this one of the, was one of the early massing uh, exercises. Um, well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can go to the next one, yeah. Um, so as Felix discussed, we are doing a project at a hotel in New York City. And maybe what's good to say is that we're doing a project with 14 people and it's about 14 different guests which come together into one hotel. So the idea is that it would serve as one hotel which operates uh, within itself 14 different hotels. Um, yeah, so then um, we are now almost at the end of the project. And I think uh, maybe to refer back to why, why we are sitting here in the model as well, um, is that the model that which was in the previous slide is actually, uh, because it's such a big building, like we visited New York City, but then even our building, uh, because it's on the side of the old Pennsylvania Hotel, which used to be the biggest hotel in the world, um, but it's been demolished because the whole area is being redeveloped um, by the big guys with money. Um, so they are now proposing on this site uh, a, s a building which is 10 meters lower than the Empire State Building. So when you're on the site, you look around, you can never really grasp how big that building would be um, because it's bigger than all the other buildings. So I think also uh, as an exercise of like thinking about this project and like making all of these things, uh, I think the scale of the project really mattered. And that's also where, uh, to understand how all of these different uh, hotels and every and how the hotel would run, how that would come together, it's also like printing these drawings, like super big, because you need to understand, you need to really explore how things come together and that needs a big size. So, um, and that's also how it sort of relates to the model then. Um, yeah, so we started seeing also how would, how could we convey the story about this hotel and this skyscraper and how can we really uh, convey how you would experience uh, the hotel uh, if as if you would be walking through New York City um, or going through the hotel. So, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so this is like one of the sections that we used to really see how the different parts of the hotel would come together and really study it precisely. So we worked uh, on one to 100 scale, which would result in four meter long drawings, um, which was super interesting. And uh, yeah, so next one. So maybe quickly to discuss what the models, which is now here. So as you, as has been discussed earlier, is that we um, have been thinking about how this exhibition would come together, and we have been uh, replicating uh, the idea of the of the exhibition in the model and really studying how. Um, can we actually uh, tell our story the best and how do we actually... Um, so basically, the, um, our narrative is, uh, consists of four different parts uh, but we uh, see within the exhibition and also in the type of the hotel, there's actually six kind of elements which we would need. So we sort of combine these four parts of the narrative with these six elements that you would have in a hotel. So maybe to start, you would have the reception desk, which includes part one, which is really like the introduction of the context of like a research that we did into New York City and to the hotel type, to the skyscraper type, and to the different guests which are staying at the hotel. Then the second one would be the lobby space, which would include part two and three, which is really about the project overview in the building. Uh, maybe a good thing to note is that we are designing a building which would outlast its function. So the ho hotel is one of the functions which would go into the hotel uh, to the tower. Um, but actually, we propose that there's actually alternative functions, which and we designed uh, for those alternative functions as well. Um, so that's why we start with the project overview and the building as a landmark and how it would outlast and function, and then part three would be the manager's office. So we also really have a focus on like, if it's something is operating as one hotel, including 14 hotels, how would the service uh, run? How would the staff be working? So really thinking about like the backside um, of the of the hotel. And that's also where we discuss, okay, this is how actually the, it operates as one hotel, um, which would be part four. And then part, f uh, so the fourth element in the exhibition is the corridor, uh, which, um, is actually the thing that combines all 14 uh, segments of the hotel uh, and also which would show how these 14 uh, hotel segments would really be experienced. And that's where the 14 key drawings, so where uh, the specificity of each hotel would really be uh, conveyed to the visitor of the exhibition. 
Then the fifth part is the hotel room. So to take it a step further, how would it really be experienced on a one-to-one -one scale? So we want to build a room, uh, the standard room. So the idea is that the rooms can be interchangeable so that the hotels, uh, maybe some at some times, they need more rooms than others, and then it can sort of swap out. So the idea is that we have, like, we used uh, specific uh, things which are used throughout uh, amongst the different hotel segments, but then there's also things which vary to be suited to the uh, hotel guests and a hotel, uh, specific hotel type. Um, so that will be the hotel room where we really represent that, and also the system, and then the sixth part would be the elevator, um, because then one of the first questions we had is like, how would you actually come into this hotel? Uh, if there is this one hotel, but you actually have 14 segments, like how would you check in? So the idea is that we have multiple sky lobbies throughout this tower, which helps you sort of navigate to your hotel, and these towers are actually like lifted public spaces throughout the building. Um, and within the elevator, the elevator is like uh, the street, sort of in a way, because it forms like the metro leading to the different sky lobbies. Um, so within, while being in the elevator in the room, you would actually experience how you would actually go through the building and how you would experience it uh, step by step. Um, yeah, that's the plan of the exhibition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you for this uh, preview. And again, I urge everyone to have a look uh, when we are done here uh, with the conversation at, at the models. Uh, maybe one question, yeah. maybe a simple or not question. So you use different scales, yeah? one to one to one to hundred and maybe even smaller. Why is the model, the volumetric model of the hotel one to 75? <laughs> it was a mediation. Because, <laughs> Mediation, uh, you had a long discussion. Well, first <laughs> we perceived it to be uh, 1 to 50, but then that would be a little bit too big. It doesn't fit. Well, it would fit, but... Oh. It would, and then uh, oh when yeah, you scale it, it down yeah. to 1 to 100, then we thought, and, well, maybe actually we feel that it looks a bit too small. So we went for one... Uh, but maybe just to fine. clarify why it would be too small, because we really think it's important that you value the object as a landmark, because it's an, a landmark in New York City. So it's, it's, you need to have sort of the, like you shouldn't be almost as tall as, as, as the building, because that's not how you would experience it. So we needed the dimension also. Yeah, so once a model becomes bigger than a person itself, it becomes a monument. That reminds me of a sculpture made by Michelangelo Pistoletto, Casa in misura di uomo, you know, and that's that, that kind of one-to-one -one relationship of the model and the person was, was extremely important. And of course, it made the model very strange, which, you know, reminds me of that, that, that so many things going on in these models. We um, <laughs> wonder, wonder what scale should these be at? Like the one to 33, which was, is perfect for photography, doesn't actually get you kind of quite close enough to approximating a kind of reality. And when I was thinking of your sections, for example, and the construction of these rooms, there is something weirdly fictional about them, you know, F filmic, a fiction about the real. And this is the model but has it leads you to this. Novel, yes, yeah. but the, but the <laughs> the model leads you to a funny place, which is not quite. It, you want to get closer and closer to the real, but it takes you to a um, you know a spot which is. Not quite there. And then I was thinking about your work, about all these things which were, you know, what is the scale of one of those crazy rocket ships? Or, you know, they, they're there, things in reality, but they're, it's uncertain. they're very uncertain. You don't know what they are in some sense. They're too big or they're too small or, or we don't know what size they should be. Yeah. They're, they, they are, yeah. you know, fictional propositions. Yeah. Yeah, my models were very often uh, two-dimensional on paper. Only, yes. You know. And uh, more lately, that I made three-dimensional models, you know, actually. Yeah. But maybe that, that's a silly question, but how do you, in the end, decide if you make, if you work on the real thing, how big it has to be? Uh, yeah, that, yeah, the, 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 the Utrecht UFO uh, yeah. building, for example, the dom that described actually how big it should be, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so the location actually this, you know, show, tells you. It's also with uh, the work on here. You know, it should not be too. Yeah, it sounds silly, but it should be too big. It should be too small. You know, it's it's. You know, you search for it. It wasn't yeah. a matter of higher powers commanding you to make the UFO a certain size because. 
<laughs> you, that's how big they are. Yeah, but uh, it, it has a visual impact, you know, yeah. you're, that's where you're looking for. And that's also with the molecule, you know, and uh, the mm. dynamics of it. And it, here it, com it goes with the traffic, as you can see. And uh, uh, yeah, that's very important. If it's too small, this is, for example, there's a, the, 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 the model is maybe 20 uh, centimeters high, so somewhere in the Groninger Museum. Uh, uh, that I put on the table, you know, for the customers, you know, and uh, but uh, yeah, this nine meters high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard it was recently uh, on the na national television. Eh? Yeah, but, uh, because it was, but it's, not for a celebration. It's, it's almost no. destroyed with Semtex, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of red paint being thrown on it, you know, because of the what happens, uh, right, you know, in Groningen. Yeah. So it's a uh, iconoclasma, eh? that's what it's mm. called. Yeah. yeah. So uh, build, the, a storm. The, build a storm. The people, there's a lot of uh, people. They have tried to to to. They want it gone. And I'm in the middle of the discussion, you know, with Rijkswaterstaat also. And but it looks like it that it stays. It's now people come calm down, you know, the <laughs> the discussion. And that people see that it also, the, what the gas did to for, for Holland, you know, that uh, we all benefited from it. And uh, it's uh, it's a bit stupid to to say it, the, the gas did it. It's people who did it, you know, <laughs> made the wrong decisions. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I'm very glad that it uh, it's going to stay. Yeah, very good. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I, I'm looking at the master model makers, so of the. The Asprum building, would you like to react? Or what's your experience making the model? Who wants to take us <laughs> along on that? <laughs> We're getting there. Ah, <laughs> 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 Jules! Yeah, just well, give the mic. <laughs> yeah, they uh, pushed me forward to respond. But I think uh, it, it's quite in line with what Mark said. <laughs> Thank goodness. It's, it's, it's <laughs> a really, really We're good open. way. <laughs> it's a really good way to get in touch with these minute details that you kind of easily overlook when you visit the building or when you look at a picture. I mean, you're really, really intensely studying what, for example, the, the chairs are, how they were positioned within the room, what color they were, especially when you're working from these black and white drawings. And then getting there and seeing that your estimations on what that space is match what is still there mm. in reality is really nice because you get a Take really off, good feel for the position that an architect put in there oh, okay. 100 years ago. And now seeing that kind of replicated before working on that project ourselves is okay. a nice way. Okay. To okay. I have start. a question. How long it takes to make such model? Oof, <laughs> and how many people? <laughs> A whole, well, 32 people, yes. 32 for this model. 32 yeah. people. And how many weeks would we say? Renzo, you have an overview of the schedule. Five weeks. Five weeks. But long so weeks much. with <laughs> nights and endless we, we're not sure. book binding we're going on. We're not on. completely sure anymore how long it took, but it took approximately four weeks. Four weeks. <laughs> with 32 people. 32. No, 32. You don't want to know, that's a good uh, addition. An exercise. So then we will have in half a year 32 models in the same scales of all the individual uh, yes. proposals for <laughs> yeah. the future of that, this building. That would be very, very yeah. nice. It would be a fantastic exhibition here. Do it. You now know how to make a model. <laughs> Sorry? They can do 32. They yeah, do 32. yeah. Uh, many of this group also made models for films of these interiors, of these Milan, tying things together here. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Jules, I know you gave up the microphone very happily, but um, you made this model of uh, Maggiarotti's uh, apartment block, for example. In, in Which one? Uh, you know, the, the one, on the, on, the one on the park. Via Quadronno. Yeah. And, um, and I just wondered if you could say something because the film you made, you made the model, which is nice, but then you made this fantastic film walking through it and with music, it was great. And, um, and I was wondering if you could say something about uh, how you felt about the, the, the culture of the, uh, did you get close to the culture of the architecture when you were making that model in the film? Because that's it's something, for example, that your book, Nelia Case, really communicates profoundly the culture of Milano. 
which is embodied in these architectural propositions. So, Jude. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, yes, it works. Uh, yeah, that was part of the project for the MC, or the, the elective yeah. uh, of interiors. Uh, but it was quite good because there were all these projects. We had about 10 movies in the end, each one approaching their context very differently. Uh, so ours was the Villa Cordonero, and we took the assembly of that building as our main take. Uh, so we made quite an abstract model that showed the, the structure of the building, and then we placed these elements in there, very elegant, the very elegant models of the facade. But other people really approached it through what happened in that building and through the philosophy of the building. There were these nice examples of two parts of the building reacting to each other. There was ones that folded, that kind of showed the, the essence of that space mm. really nicely. And that, through that, you could kind of experience what the intention of the architect was at the time mm. and, of course, in what context uh, that was made. Yeah. Thank you. Mark or any of you, you don't use uh, human silhouettes in your models at all. It was, right? Is there, can you? No. Yeah, can you please uh, <laughs> let us know why? Well, there's always a problem of how you make them. There's the, there's the OMA version of where, it's, where everyone's orange, which is <laughs> this. Then there's the kind of version where everyone, look, like Sana, where everyone looks like a cartoon. But we actually thought the spaces and the artifacts would be able to communicate all that stuff. So things are spoke of people and their arrangements. And the, and the most beautiful uh, arrangements of living were made in these interiors, where you could really imagine, you know, people have just left the room. You know, there, uh, cigarette smoke, I recall, in, <laughs> in one model of an Auguste Perret interior. So, um, you know, it was, um, life was suggested. We believe in people in these buildings, but we just don't see them. They've left the room, or they're about to arrive. Okay, and yeah, hard I think to, it you know, hard to do hands and things. One question for yeah. Simona. Well, uh, thank you very much, for everybody, for their presentations, and thanks, Simona, for showing us your work, which I personally admire very much. I have a question. Um, I am involved in, and this is a personal concern, so maybe this is kind of a consultorio. Yeah. Okay. So, I am involved in a publication which is uh, going to have between 1,000 and 1,500 pages, which is a very big format. No? And we are in front of a book which is maybe like that. And we are receiving uh, criticism uh, given the moment in which we are. How can we produce, mass produce, I don't know how many thousand copies will be produced of that book, how much paper that is going to be consumed, how much weight in transportation, what's the CO2 footprint, etc. So, and then I receive these critics and I don't know what to tell, what to say. What would you tell them? <laughs> I, I had the same critics from my publisher because this book should have been 400 pages. And finally, at the end of July, we say, oh, sorry, there are 700. So we had uh, <laughs> the cost of the paper and everything. There. But uh, I think that uh, having a book, uh, it's completely different uh, for the minds. Uh, we try to compare, to read the plans. And when we have uh, a PDF or something virtual, we do not we don't really fix images. We don't really deepen into. Okay, uh, we have been discussing about uh, two ideas of large. One is large uh, dimension of scale of these models, and the other one is a large dimension of the books. So not scale, but simply uh, heavy books. But I think that in this uh, uh, unfolding this book, uh, you really can see all together this is much. When you look at the virtual, you actually see one slide by the other. When you have it in your hand, you can give a dimension, give a passing through, uh, going back, uh, uh, deepen into one image, and then confronting with the other. So I think it's, uh, the paper makes sense still. Thanks. Um, we need to get going. There's a question there. 
from Martijn. Yeah. So there's a there's a really I think a quite big tradition of having art pieces in front of uh, important buildings. I mean we all know Seagram with the uh, sculptures all, all there. Am I right? So yeah, the whole sculpture program. Yeah. yeah so why? I, well, maybe it's a suggestion. Like maybe you can have a sculpture and also want to. Um, maybe Mark oh, yeah. can. Uh, yeah, Mark. <laughs> it's actually, uh, there are actually uh, there some are okay. sculptures yeah. thought of on the ground floor. But there yeah. are also very, a lot of. Um, and some things I also don't understand, for example, Frank Gehry, you know, is a very sculptural architect, and then he works together with Klaus Oldenburg, you know, the big binoculars. Yeah. And he said, you know, why? You know? Uh, his building in uh, in Spain, you know, with uh, the Guggenheim, with uh, Jeff Koons' puppy dog, very big, that I understand, you know. Uh, but it's, mm. uh, sometimes, uh, but you know, the camel on top of the Kunsthal in Rotterdam is uh, that, you say, hey, there's a, why is there a camel on the roof? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but and sometimes it uh, solves an architectural problem. Eh? I, I always like the example of the, the Bayekov in Rotterdam designed by Breuer, but according to the urban rules, he had to make uh, a part coming forward, but he wanted the box. So then uh, they asked Naum Gabo to make that huge sculpture. So they said, no, not the building is coming forward, but we have that big sculpture. Yeah. It's a bit, a bit, bit funny because, you know, a building is also, yeah, it's sculpture, you know, yeah. and it's also visual poetry if it's really good you know and um, yeah but why it's like uh, to, to, to put a face on a cabinet you know uh, why, why, why is it there I you know why Gary had a special idea because he sort of had all these great relationships with artists he had done a lot of artist studios yeah, yeah, yes, yes, in, yes, yes, in yes. the 60s particularly yeah and so he always th imagined a kind of collaboration of you know things that would work against each other and with each other so the class Oldenburg, you know, the, the ob object, the binoculars and that ad, ad agencies, he, he, just, he just liked it. I like this clash. Yeah. And, and of course, when it, he couldn't make anybody else do it, he did it himself, yes. His own <laughs> fish, for example, on top of it. Yeah. Or now this owl thing, which is a great crumpled bit of paper. Yeah. But, but yeah, you're right about sometimes this doesn't work. Yeah, it's tradition, you know. <laughs> if we have here in Holland, we have you know that uh, there's a, a public program here for yes, uh, for art, you know, a public space. And there was uh, before actually every city used one to two percent, you know, of the, the building sum on art, and we just did it. But that's all cancelled. It's all past history. Yeah. You know, there's some, a few cities who are still doing that, but uh, now it's really to totally different. Uh, in a, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in a city like New York, like everyone it's says it, like you don't uh, you don't look up, you don't look at the yeah. buildings, you just look at the ground floor because you just want to walk through the street. So I think for us, finding something that really lures people into the hotel, uh, people that don't know the hotel or people that, because it is such a, it's also a specific. I, so we really wanted something that binds all these 14 guests together and to really attract people um, into the building. And for us art was something that really could bind all these people together and really spark something when you're walking on the street something that would maybe like change over time um, so what's good what's it going to be or who is it going to be or because it's, it's very difficult to invent a work of art of course as an architect yeah. <laughs> but we will see that in two weeks yes. i think yes, we it's a good okay. question mark to wrap mm. up there yeah. all right thank you when we see no. the exhibition no. yeah <laughs> Thank you Javier? very much, yeah. everyone, for uh, joining us today. Thank you for uh, the great work. And I'm especially happy to have the authors explaining what they do in a very relaxed manner. So thanks again and again, and the students participating today and the students engaging in the, conver in the conversation. This is the purpose of the BK Talks, after all. Um, we are back in the next semester, 13th of February. We have prepared uh, already a semester full of events, exhibitions of BK Talks. Our program has uh, expanded a little bit because now we have the OSER and the smaller room, uh, the collections room. 
which means that we uh, have uh, a bigger program. I will not go with all of it because uh, we all want to get going home or elsewhere. Um, but next uh, Friday, not next Tuesday, uh, February 13, uh, we will be screening the Robin Hood Gardens film. Uh, Dick van der Heuvel is on top of it, and the authors of that film will be actually presenting that. So I already saw the movie, and maybe maybe some of you already saw it. It's uh, it's uh, fantastic. Um, in any case, you have there an overview. We will publish the new calendar in the coming uh, two weeks, so you will have the chance uh, to browse through the uh, events. Again, thank you very very much. I was also very happy to see so much manual work. Uh, in a world in which uh, so much digital fabrication is being imposed, especially in other schools. I think we are extremely privileged to have the space that we have here to work with our hands. So keep doing that. You can do digital fabrication the rest of your life. Thank you very, very much. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.